Hey everyone, this is Jen and you're watching BPD Woman. In today's video, you're going to learn the differences and similarities in relationship dynamics with those of us with BPD or CPTSD and when we find partners that display NPD or narcissistic personality disorder traits. You're also going to learn how to differentiate between what's your responsibility and what's not your responsibility in a relationship. And I'm going to give you six insights, including one big tip on how you can clearly and accurately look at what's yours to assume for responsibility at the end of a relationship. Let's get going. So today I am taking a video suggestion from a viewer. Um, and I got so many replies on the uh, last call for video suggestions that I put out just a few weeks ago. And I've gotten three and I've worked on one, which I will be releasing this week. And now this is the second one that I'm releasing. And this is uh, from Kate Contra. Hello, Kate. Kate is a rather new viewer and she has a wonderful suggestion. And so let me read her suggestion in its entirety. Kate says, and I'll be reading here, can you speak to when you find yourself in a relationship that is toxic and abusive and after it is over or during it, it is confusing and scary to sift through the details and where you should take responsibility versus acknowledging your significant other's toxic contributions to relationship? Wonderful question. Is it their gaslighting or was it my BPD? Was it their anger and rage issues or did I drive them to it, etc.? I want to take responsibility and I also do not want to be scapegoated and believe certain accusations for the sake of the other person's agenda. Great insight, Kate. I also do not want to be black and white and I want to see more of the gray. Finally, she says, wow, it is a lot to grow up in an emotionally abusive home and then repeat the pattern romantically and afterward be afraid of not having the skills to discern what I need to be fully aware of and responsible for so I can be a better person versus what I need to believe, i.e. gaslighting, blame shifting, to avoid holding on to untrue toxic beliefs that were made about me in the devaluing stage. Well, Kate, first of all, Thank you for this and thanks for joining the channel. Um, what a wonderful voice you are. And I want to say you have a wonderful insight already into your situation because f from this, you have, from your contribution here, um, the viewer suggestion, you have pointed out so many different insights and things that are going on. And I think you already probably deep down have a little bit of an answer of what has happened to you during this last relationship. And I also want to say that um, you are a better person. I think the term that maybe you are looking for is how to be more effective or more emotionally regulated. But I definitely on this channel, I try to steer away from um, words such as good, bad, better, um, good, because they're not really true descriptors, right? Like really what is better? So, um, You've, you've, you've pointed out so many great issues and the first thing that obviously jumps out at me is that it sounds to me like you're describing that you were in a relationship with a narcissist. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, the blame shifting, the gaslighting, the, um, you know, them putting certain accusations and using you as a scapegoat. Um, and the other thing that jumps out at me is, and I, and I, and I'll say I've had um, a couple of really toxic relationships with people that I think were genuinely narcissistic, but one that has been pervasive in my life is somebody that has been in and out of my life for about the last 14 years. And he is a true textbook narcissist and, and I can cover that in more detail. However, um, what I pick up on is this initially and then we'll kind of flesh this out because as borderlines or those of us that have been diagnosed with borderline we have been taught over and over you use extreme thinking you use black and white thinking 
we would really like you to use more gray zone thinking. We would really like you to be more cognizant of the way that you use your splitting or cognitive distortions. And I've done a video on cognitive distortions and I'll put up a link and it, it goes into more detail about what those distortions look like and how to break them. I give you some tips. And then we get into these relationships that can be very um, toxic. Hey, stop it, Zena. Then we get into these relationships that are very toxic and things start to happen to us. Arguments start to come up. You know, people make promises and then they break them. You know, they they begin to re-invalidate you, something that you're used to, right? Like they'll say, that didn't happen. No, we were never supposed to meet at that time. What are you talking about, right? You're being crazy again. And then slowly over time, the temperature gets turned up and you're like, wait, what the hell is going on in this relationship right now? And because you're so accustomed to thinking in extremes and hearing people say, oh, you know, you're, you're being really splitting with your thinking right now. Like you, you shouldn't see it like that, right? Like how many times have you heard that? I have. You convince yourself that, hey, maybe I should keep giving this relationship a few more chances because I'm so used to not giving people chances and I shouldn't just keep splitting on this person and why don't I just go ahead and give them 50 more chances, right? So the first thing I wanna say is that sometimes it is okay to be black and white with certain things. It is okay sometimes, of course. It's recommended to be gray zone what I call the gray zone thinking, right? Looking at the good, looking at the bad, looking at the cumulative, looking at the specific. But over time, if you see a pattern of behaviors that don't match up or you are in a relationship with somebody who is being abusive to you and, and you know, you're documenting this, or if you constantly feel that you're dysregulated with this person, then yeah, it is okay to just cut that off and they don't deserve any second chances. And there are certain phrases that certain people may use or there are things that people may say to you that are absolute deal breakers. And, and to each of us, those deal breakers are specific. But certain deal breakers for me would be like someone cheating on me, you're done. Um, one of the narcissists in my life that I've dealt with on and off for the last 14 years, he's told me at least on two occasions that I should just go ahead and kill myself, right? That's a deal breaker. That's something where you should close the door. Somebody stealing money, somebody assaulting you, somebody being violent, right? Someone like really betraying your trust. They don't deserve any more gray zone chances, okay? They're done. You can be done with them. So first I want to, that's the first thing here, is that realizing that you're used to black and white thinking and now you're trying to use more gray zone thinking, right? And it can be confusing when you should stop giving someone chances and stop living in that gray zone. But there are specific deal breakers that you must determine for yourself and it's okay to get feedback on some other people or look at other people's relationships to determine that. Or even put yourself in an opposite position. If a friend told you, hey, my boyfriend told me I should go kill myself, what would you tell your friend? You would probably tell them, where's your boyfriend? I'm going to go punch him in the face, right? <laughs> or you should break up with that guy, right? So if, if, you would have a kind of strong reaction to a situation like that, that a friend might be communicating to you, then the first thing I wanna say is no more chances. But I understand that weird sort of pattern or place that you get in when you're trying to be more gray zoned and then you go back to this like, well, let me give them five more chances. Again, that can be another extreme dichotomy to be in. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I want to explore a little bit more here in detail is that if you have BPD, you generally, there is, you can generally find yourself on the other end of a relationship with someone who has NPD. Now, why is this? Well, first of all, both NPD and borderline personality disorder, they are both cluster B personality disorders. And, and the cluster B being the erratic and the dramatic. So it's histrionic, borderline, NPD, and I think there's one more I may be forgetting. But they're the more ex they're the more like dramatic emotional personality disorders. So even though they're in the same personality disorder, 
those with BBD and those with NPD have a lot of differences. All, they have some similarities, but they also have some differences. And, and the, the main difference in those relationships is that somebody with BPD has tons of empathy. They, they feel raw in their emotions, right? I call this the emotional fibromyalgia, where, you know, you can't see the emotion. You can't feel the emotion necessarily if you're someone else looking in, but nonetheless, it is there and it is very powerful and it is incredibly raw. And those of us with BPD, we feel emotions for longer, more intensely, and it takes us longer to come off of that emotional high and return to our emotional baseline. Those with NPD, on the other hand, they seek transactions. They don't necessarily seek relationships, they seek transactions. I literally had a boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend once tell me that the sole reason that he saw marriages like a reason to get married, and he had been married and divorced because he cheated on his ex-wife, go figure. He said, um, well, I would get married because the other person does stuff for you. And I like my, and he sat there with a totally straight face and he said that. And I was like, wait, that's the main reason? He's like, yeah, because, you know, like then it makes your life easier to be married. That's what he, that's the value he saw in getting married. So that's a perfect example of someone with NPD seeking a transaction where somebody with BPD seeks a relationship. And while those of us with BPD might not have fully fledged, um, healthy, insights on what that relationship could look like would look like we still seek someone to be our partner and we're very we feel very deeply somebody with bpd has a very low self-esteem someone with npd has nothing but esteem in fact they have a grandiose they have a grandiose excuse me idea of themselves they they feel like they deserve everything where somebody with bpd doesn't feel like they can ask for much. They ha they look to others to validate them. And here's the similarity. People with NPD also have lower self-esteem. Although they have, they present with grandeur and they present like they know everything, they actually have very fragile egos. And so it's common for someone with NPD to link up for BPD with these reasons. BPDs wish to please, NPDs want to be pleased. BPDs have low self-esteem. Those with NPD can expose and manipulate that. And so you find yourselves in these because as somebody with BPD, at least on my end, I always wanted to please these types of folks. Um, and I just kept thinking, well, if, if the more that I do or the more that I say or if I make more of an effort, they will do A, B, or C for me. They will be kinder. They will pull more of their weight. They will put more money towards our relationship. They will stop abusing drugs or alcohol. It won't happen. It's a fruitless search. So you often will find yourself in a dynamic with this if you have BPD. Now, why is this? Well, um, you repeat old family dynamics which is something that Kate already touched on here in her, in her statement, you know, wow, it's a lot to grow up in an emotionally abusive re home and then repeat the pattern romantically and afterward and be afraid of not having the skills to discern what I need to be fully aware of and responsible. Okay. So yes, Kate, you're absolutely right. And I have talked about this in one of my videos. It's actually my most popular video on my channel. I want to say it's up to 700 views, maybe. Um, on object constancy and what object constancy is. And so please check out that video to get more of an idea of what I'm going to talk about right here. But if you grow up in a wonderful home where your parents are always there and they're healthy and they encourage you to think for yourself and they listen to your feelings and they accept your feelings and they accept you and, and you know, they make you feel like a valuable person and they validate your beliefs and they encourage you to grow healthy as a person, you're going to, you're going to seek out romantic partners and friendships and other types of dynamics like work environments in the same manner. You're going to seek that out. Why? Because that's what you grew up with, you know, monkey see, monkey do. However, if you grow up in an invalidating environment, if you grow up in an abusive environment, if you grow up in a chaotic environment, that does seem normal. 
It's become normalized to you. You have spent essentially decades kind of being brainwashed into thinking that this is normal or okay behavior. And whether you subconsciously or unsubconsciously know that it's not acceptable behavior, and Kate sounds very tuned in that it's not acceptable behavior, you still seek out these patterns, even though you will say, I do not want somebody who's, you know, um, abuses alcohol. I do not want somebody who would, you know, not be able to keep a job. And so you, unfortunately, unless you really do some very deep introspection on the kinds of dynamics you're forming, and really, before you even get into those dynamics, it takes a long time and a continued amount of time in DBT and one-on-one -on -one therapy with a psychologist that's trained in personality disorders, you're not going to get much further beyond this sort of negative connection. And you'll keep repeating these behaviors. Um, and believe me, I repeated them for a really long time. And I, you know, since that, that narcissist, I have not been in a relationship in about two years and that's fine with me. Um, that's totally fine. And you know, that speaks volumes about where I was five, 10 years ago, because I'd be like, Oh, let me get, let me get back on OkCupid. Let me get back on match.com. Let me get back on Bumble. I need to find somebody else and replace this. Right. Be why? I mean, the primary reason is that I feel okay with being alone and I feel good and clear about who I am and what I want and what's healthy. Now, Okay, so we've been over that NPDs and BPDs generally link up. And we've been over that, you know, because of a lack, a lack of object constancy and, and developing healthy patterns of relationships growing up, you can repeat family dynamics in your romantic relationships. Now, what does this all lead to? Well, this leads to what is known as the trauma bond, okay? And the trauma bond, and I'm going to put up some definitions here, trauma bonds essentially are bonds that are based out of intermittent positive reinforcement, but whose underlying and overlying presence is built on abuse. So, you know, you've heard of probably Stockholm Syndrome. They've kind of, you know, the psychology community is sort of like poo-poo that, that, you know, the Stockholm Syndrome is not really a thing. But essentially, trauma bonding, it can be summarily summed up as Um, an abuser, a victim beginning to sympathize with their abuser over time. And, you know, if relationships were completely abusive and you came home every day and you got punched in the face, it would be pretty easy to leave that relationship. Unfortunately, that's not how these abusive relationships are. You know, they will start off love bombing you just like Kate acknowledged you, right? They will be there all the time. They'll be calling you. They'll be sending you flowers. They want to chat with you. Hi, how are you? Good morning. They'll send you emojis, right? That starts off and you're like, wow, like, and you're just, woo, love bomb, love bomb. Like, this is amazing. And I don't think that all love bombing is manipulative. I just don't think that narcissists um, really get much deeper than that. I don't think they're really in tune with who they are. And I think they're just as scarred emotionally from what's happened as a, as a result of traumatic upbringings, just as those of us with BPDs are. So I don't think that it's necessarily all manipulative. I think that it is something that they genuinely feel. I just think that after a while that mask drops and they really don't know how to get beyond that love bomb stage or what other people would call the honeymoon period into, you know, the real nuts and bolts of what a relationship is. Not a healthy one anyway. You know, if you're two both functioning alcoholics, sure, you could probably stay linked up for decades. As long as you don't ask for anything or challenge them, they'll be there. You'll just be reinforcing each other's mental illnesses, right? Like addiction, you know. So you get these, tra you connect these trauma bonds and essentially you keep going back to that, well, they were nice to me, you know, or they, they've said really lovely things or like, I feel in love with them. And, you know, but then they, you know, they will ghost you or, you know, they will stonewall you or they will not engage you in a discussion. You know, they will, um, they will do manipulative behaviors. They won't show up when they said they will. 
But in the middle, as this goes on for months and months, they'll do something really nice. Like they'll, you know, they'll send you a really lovely text message or they'll, you know, they'll surprise you with something. Um, they'll buy you a gift. So it's this intermittent reinforcement. So it makes it harder to leave because you're like, well, they do do these nice things. And so it begins to kind of cloud your perception and your interpretation of this relationship. So you develop these trauma bonds, which then in turn makes it really hard for you to leave. Now, of course, I have done plenty of unhealthy, ineffective, sometimes abusive things to my partners, calling them names, you know, calling their bosses, blowing up their phones, talking shit about them, posting shit about them on Facebook, of course. And so, you know, Kate, what you are tuned into here is that, yes, you know, um, if, if you have done behaviors, you know, yes, then you do need to sift through that and take responsibility for that and responsibility meaning okay like you you accept what you've done you realize how has that made me feel well you know when I when I did call his boss that did not make me feel really great what can I do in the future I want to be a better person for me it doesn't necessarily mean that you apologize to the person and I and I wouldn't recommend apologizing to a narcissist because they're going to use it as collateral against you. See, I was right, right? Is this will reaffirm their hold on you? Aha! See, you were wrong all along. So, but it means that you, unless you know they weren't a narcissist, then yes, of course you make amends, you apologize. Sometimes people don't want to hear your apology. Sometimes they will and they will accept it. But nonetheless, you do it because it's the right thing for you to do if that is what you've determined is the right thing for you to do. So of course, the devil is in the details, you know, you do need to sift through. But the thing here, Kate, also to remember, and to all viewers is that no relationship is one sided. And when two people break up, or when two people get together, or when there's a success, or when there's a failure, no one person is ever to blame. And if you hear a significant other or family member say, this is all your fault. I only did this because you did that. I don't know what you're talking about. This is all in your head. Then guess what? You are being gaslighted. And some of the favorite phrases that someone with NPD uses to gaslight you is, I never said that. You know, I, I didn't mean it like that. You're being crazy. Oh, here we go again. Oh, you're really sick. Like, oh, you're just starting another argument, right? These are their favorite phrases to use, and what do they all share in common? The effect of shame. They want to shame you into silence. So my response to that is you just keep talking. You keep asserting yourself. And I've done another video about learning to assert yourself when someone's gaslighting you or ignoring you. So I'll put a link up to that. When and where also to take responsibility, um, I've also covered this in a video called It's Not You, It's Them. This was like my newest video. Not, ev not everything that you do in life or that is done to you can be explained by your BPD. And it's easy to think like that because, and again, this video is called It's Not You, It's Them. Your BPD doesn't explain everything because... It's easy, and I have, I've been in this. <laughs> oh, you want your belly rub? I've been in this, you know, oh, it must be because of my BPD. I'm a jerk, I'm a loser, I'm this, I'm that, right? It's very hard to kind of break out of that sort of thinking. But again, that's a really black and white way to look at the world. Like, oh, everything must be because of my BPD. Mm, not really, okay. So when you look to take responsibility and what they've done the one of the ways that i recommend like sifting through all this is is a tool that i learned on um, another self-help channel and she and this channel talks all about codependency um and that is when I was trying to sift this out through what I went through with this narcissist, you know, and I was asking these same questions, Kate, like, what's my responsibility? What's their responsibility? Did I do this? Who, you know, am I being gaslighted? Am I making them crazy? You know, they're angry. Like, they must be angry because I'm a bad person. I sat down and I made a list. And I made a few lists. And again, this was a a homework assignment essentially provided by this life coach on this channel. And she said, um, 
make several lists. The first list you're going to use is a list of how you wanted to feel with this person. How, okay, how you wanted, and then like the facts, like how you came to feel. So in my list, I wrote, I wanted to feel like I was in an equal partnership. I wanted to feel protected. I wanted to feel heard. I wanted to feel loved and valued. Okay, well, how did I end up feeling? I, I ended up feeling like I was doing all the work. I ended up feeling like I was never heard or I was shut down. Instead of feeling protected, I felt attacked, right? Another list was, you know, what you wanted physically or, you know, um, tangibly out of the relationship and then what you received. So I wanted my partner who was long distance, I wanted him to pay have havesies on things like my plane tickets and things like that. Um, what did I get? No money. Um, you know, I, I wanted him to make some of the international phone calls or half. He made one eighth of the phone calls, right? I wanted him not to drink and smoke. He drank and smoked. So you're going to do that. And then you're going, this is my favorite one. You're going to write out what they said and promised and what they actually did. So my ex would say, you know, um, I want to be with you for the end of time. You're safe with me. I want, I hear you. I'm here to protect you. But then the things that they really said were, I hope you go kill yourself. Um, you're crazy. You know, I never said that, right? And the point of creating these lists is that you can, you know, because when everything's in your head and it's just all going around in all different directions, it's hard to just kind of like really center in on what has happened here. But when you put it down on paper like this and you start reading these out you're like wow you know it becomes very clear what they've done and how they're behaving and when it's on paper and when you're taking the time you rate it out it slows down your thinking and your emotional processes so you can be like oh yes this this is bullshit this is i'm being gaslighted here he said this but he did this right you even using like your actual texts Right? Like, I would do that. I'd be like, look, you said this here. Sorry. I was like, you said this here. Well, no, I didn't. Really? And then you show it to them, and they'd still be like, well, that's not what I meant. Yeah, okay, whatever. Okay, so that helps you, Kate. That that helps you break this down and to see more clearly wh where you can obviously see the gaslighting and the blame shifting. Um, and the number one thing here is to not take this stuff personally because... This is what they will do to anyone. And no, their next relationship is not going to be any different or better, you know, and they will continue like this over and over. Um, the final thing that I want to say here is that, and, and by the way, when I made those lists, it really did help me. And making those lists also, I took photos of them and then I saved them on my phone and I create a little album for them because... In doing so, when I might start to miss him or I might start to doubt my sanity or if I was seeing things clearly, going to those lists and quickly seeing them on my phone realized, no, I was absolutely right in my assessment. Um, the last thing here is that oftentimes a way that... Um, those with NPD can sort of corner us or take away a little bit of our power is you may come to them with a legitimate discussion point or complaint or something that you want changed and they will deny you. They will gaslight you and then that will make you ramp up your defense of what you want or what you're seeing or what you want changed and then they get angrier and then it's an argument and now you're arguing with them and now you've become so emotionally dysregulated that you are attacking them and this used to happen to me i would have a legitimate concern or question that i would want addressed they would be like i don't know what you're talking about i would get angrier then i would betray myself because i would start to lash out and in lashing out at them, then gave them 
a reason to be like, oh, see, I knew you were going to be crazy. And then that they could chalk up not only my lashing out, but also my legitimate concern. And they would throw that away in one ball over their head because that gave them an out. That gave them a way to be like, see, I don't have to actually address this because you're acting nuts right now. So don't betray yourself and what you want and your legitimate needs and requests in a relationship by name calling, by blowing up their Facebook, by, you know, sending them 50 text messages in a row. You don't need to do all that. And if you do do that, first of all, you're going to feel emotionally dysregulated. And secondly, it's also going to give them a reason not to address any of your concerns, which is in, in essence what they want. I hope this has been insightful, a little bit about trauma bonds, the NPD, BPD dynamic, object constancy, and how you can see the trees from the forest by using these lists. My name's Jen. You've been watching BPD Woman and my animals. Please like, share, subscribe, comment below. And until I see you next time in everything you do, please be effective. Bye-bye.